to the point with Congressman Bill Pascrell, focusing on the concerns and issues facing the families of New Jersey's 9th Congressional District. Hello, I'm uh, Congressman Bill Pascrell, and I'd like to welcome you to the latest edition of To The Point. We have two great congressmen from the Northeast joining us today. First up, representing the 1st Congressional District of Connecticut is Congressman John Larson. Uh, congressman Larson began serving his Hartford-based district in Congress in 1999. Uh, Same year as Mr. <laughs> Capuano. Yes, but before that, he was a high school history teacher, just like me. He also owned an insurance company, served on the East Hartford Board of Education and the East Hartford Town Council before being elected to the Connecticut State Senate and ultimately Congress. He's former chairman of the House Democratic Caucus, and John, uh, John's leadership in Washington is well known, it's profound, and he's a man of integrity. That's why he's here. He sits alongside of me on the Ways and Means Committee, which has jurisdiction over nation's tax code, trade policy, Social Security, we'll talk about that in a little while, and Medicare. Second person, two good friends here, representing the 7th Congressional District in Massachusetts is Congressman Mike Capuano. Uh, Congressman Capuano is serving his that, ninth <laughs> term, representing a district in Massachusetts that covers much of Boston, um, and includes the, his hometown of Somerville, of course. He served uh, as mayor in the nines. We've got two mayors here, John. You were only on the city council, correct? Correct. <laughs> but I was a Senate president. <laughs> I forgot to mention I'm sorry. You did. Sorry. Uh, he is a lawyer by trade. Uh, Congressman Capuano serves on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, Financial Services Committee, very critical, two critical committees, and the House Ethics Committee. Uh, John and Mike, thank you for joining us today. I'm proud to have both of you. Good to be here with you, Bill. And, uh, you know, things have changed since you got here in 90. You became here the same year. I was here one term ahead of you guys. What's changed the most, John, as far as you're concerned, the day-to-day -day operations that you come into this Congress now for? Well, Congress has always been a, um, a place where you would have a division along the uh, uh, party lines, right. but it's never uh, been as partisan as it is today. What do you, I what say do you mean partisan, by that, but when I say partisan, yeah. I mean that it's become more factious with one element uh, having a particular uh, precedence over uh, the other members of the Republican conference. They're primarily known as the Freedom Caucus, uh, but uh, for the last six years, what we've seen is obstructionism. But it's essentially a core group of people who are opposed to government in general. Instead of uh, focusing on, it's not about. So you think it's worse now than you were when you first got here? Yes, I don't. I think, uh, and I don't think they're bad people uh, by right. any stretch of the imagination. They come from a different point of view, but I think their point of view uh, is one <clears throat> that George Washington warned about in his farewell address: when government is at war with itself. Mm. Uh, and that's what's happening in the United States Congress, uh, then uh, that's the worst thing that can happen to a republic and a democracy. And so it's up to people like us to continue to reach across the aisle and hopefully be the governing body in the right. majority and then do it then, but to uh, reach out and get something done on behalf of the American people. Thank you. What do you think, Mike? What's, what's Quite the simply, thing? I just think that Congress right now is being held hostage to a minority group, but a group that holds sway in the Republican caucus. Uh, that came here promising, this is, shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, promised to not compromise That's on correct. anything. That's what they said in their literature. They said it, and they're doing it. I, I, when mm -hmm. I come to Congress, I tell people I'm going to fight for Social Security and education and housing right, and right, all right. that. I do it. Right. And in this case, it's not the substance. It, I mean, we have substantive disagreements, obviously. Right. It's the unwillingness, the absolute total unwillingness to compromise on the important issues. So therefore, of course, if you and I disagree on something, right. you know, if you take a step forward, I'll take a step forward. If you take two, I'll take two. And that's the way life is, not just Boy, politics. Um, but in this case, we have people who they just think that compromise is a swear word. And, I, and nothing's going to change until that changes. The three of us have talked about how do we meet halfway across the bridge anyway. Uh, on, on some subjects that we think we can get some compromise. 
And one of the subjects that you two guys have worked on, and I was fortunate enough to work with you, was Social Security. So, John, you worked on a piece of legislation, which Mike and I are co-sponsor of, and we traveled the Northeast to talk to people about this legislation. Can you tell us quickly? Well, you're both original co-sponsors, and I think we start from a, from a basic premise. Uh, <clears throat> that very group that Mike is talking about has referred to Social Security as an entitlement program. It's not an entitlement. An insurance it's the insurance program. insurance that you paid for. <laughs> right. And I think that that's where, the, where, that's where I think compromise can be achieved because this is not about an entitlement program. This is an insurance program. It's called FICA, the Federal Insurance Contribution Act. Whose contribution? Yours and the constituents that you represent. Right. And so they've paid into a system, and so they expect it to be there. And as both of you know, the system hasn't made a significant adjustment since 1983. What insurance premium amongst any of your constituents hasn't gone up since right. 1983? And you know the business, John. You were in the insurance business. I was in the insurance business. And listen, the insurance industry would be the first to say when it comes to your financial security, when it comes to estate planning, there's three legs on the stool. And one of the most important legs is Social Security. The other is personal savings and finance. And what happened to people after 2008 their 401ks became 101ks. Thank God we resisted the efforts of George Bush in to privatize Social Security. So we find ourselves in a position where really all we have to do is make an, a premium adjustment, an adjustment in a way that we enhance the program, not cut it, not have people wait longer right. or say that you, you, know, you have to be older in order to receive it or cut their benefits so, as they age. So this legislation definitely it does not pay homage to privatization of Social Security. No. No two ways about it. Michael, what's your take on what John came to us about and we hopefully gave you some good ideas? We, we, all, we all know that something has to be done in Social Security. I mean, it's not going to disappear tomorrow. Right. Um, part of the problem, as I see it, is that there's very few people around today that remember what life was like before Social Security. How they, many millions were on? How, how many people who had nothing? You know, my ancestors, my grandfathers, right. and, and many people had nothing. It's easy to put some money away when you make some money, but if you drive a truck your whole life and raise five kids and struggle to keep a home together, it's almost impossible to put anything away. And Social Security gave them the dignity of having some income in their later lives. And it's easy to say, and it sounds wonderful, the problem is nobody understands what happened before Social Security. And that, exactly. I, once people see it again, I think they'll be clamoring left and right to make sure that we, we stabilize it again. In the meantime, there is plenty of room. John's proposal is a great proposal, but there's also plenty of room to compromise that. Um, but again, you have to be- That's the attractive to, part of it. Absolutely. What you just said. But you have to have somebody on the other side of the table who's willing to have that discussion. And right. thus far, it's almost impossible to find anybody who really wants to. But let's remember, the people that won't compromise right now are the very people that for 60 years, 70 years, said they didn't like Social Security. Right. They said they wanted to kill it right from the get-go. The thing that is so onerous to me is the fact that, for instance, in 2016, uh, 2017, there is no increase in the cost of living in Social Security. So you, you got the same as you got last year or whatever. This has happened a few times in the past several years. Six. In, in, the, in six years. Wow. That's a lot longer than I thought. What does that say uh, to the seniors? And then, again, what don't we like? And we, we've discussed this before. What don't we like about that formula? And quickly, how should it be changed? Well, what the bill does, it does four things. First, it increases Social Security across the board by 2%, right. a modest increase. Secondly, it says, especially for working women who find themselves in the god-awful situation where they could have paid in all their quarters but retire into poverty. So our bill says that the new floor for Social Security will be 125% of poverty. The third thing we do, addressing the concern of a COLA, is say that COLAs will be calculated not on, C, not on CPI, but on what we call CPIE, something that the AARP has been uh, pushing for a number of years. And that means essentially your cost of living is based on medical uh, devices, food. Uh, uh, food, heating and cooling your homes, doctor visits, You know, most people don't know that that's not included? They don't. And right now? Well, it's and calculated how we calculate by the your payments? CPI in general. And so that 
accounts for when you take into all consumer goods right. a lot of things that the elderly don't spend on. That's we don't have an increase. The other thing that we do, and most significantly, is we provide a tax cut. There'll be 11 million Americans currently, and that's only going to grow with the baby boomers coming, continuing to come through Social Security, get an instant tax cut. And that's 11 million people. Why? Because we haven't touched this program since right. 1983, and because it wasn't indexed, if you're single and making more than $25,000, you're taxed on your Social Security. If you're a married couple, and you know what that's like in New Jersey and Massachusetts and Connecticut, your married couples probably have more than $32,000 in income, which means their Social Security is taxed. And people are either working for two reasons. Right. One, because they like the idea of feeling useful and, and having a purpose. And the other, more likely, because they need it. And so why should we be taxing them again on those benefits? This has received broad appeal, and it's one of the catches that a number of our Republican colleagues really like about this. And the program's completely paid for. It doesn't increase the national we're gonna debt. To that. We're going to millennials... get to how we pay for it in a second. Sure. But, Mike, we, you and I talked about this very specific. You know, back 10 years ago when Lindsey Graham was in the House of Representatives, he and I uh, came to some agreement on how we're going to make some changes with Social Security. One of the things he agreed with was raising the threshold. So w what does that mean, Michael? A long overdue. I mean, right now... The 100, was it 117,000? Something like that, yeah, 110, 115, something like that. You don't tax beyond that. Yeah, which means Warren Buffett pays the exact same amount of money in FICA as... I there do. you go. <laughs> <laughs> and and i I, I got to be honest. I mean, everybody, this is a controversial issue, but I think that... People like Warren Buffett, and he, he's not a problem. He right. actually agrees with this concept, but, you know, Donald Trump, they should be paying into it. And uh, they should be part of the solution, making sure that seniors don't have to make the difficult choices they used to make. So part of the bill goes from, and the threshold goes from 117 to 400,000. Correct. So now more money, more revenue is going to be coming in. And, you know, when we're out in front of seniors talking about this, we essentially say this. For Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, they stop paying into the program at 9 o'clock on January 1st. That's how much money they have. And so what 400,000 represents is four-tenths of 1% 1 of the American people. So why do that? Well, because of the buffer that's needed, because of the increase of baby boomers coming through the population, that's why we opted to go that. It also follows the Republican uh, change in the tax code that was made in 2012 in an effort to attract Republicans to this and say that we're, you know, this is being reasonable. And also, quite frankly, to look at middle class right. uh, individuals who are dealing with paying for education, having to refinance their houses, having to deal with medical expenses and loss of benefits. And so it was felt that this would add on to them too much of a burden. But everybody's going to have skin in the game with this. Good. We've got to do something about Social Security. Uh, and we've got to pay for it. There's no two ways about it. It's not pie in the sky. We need to extend it. This plan extends it for 75 years at least beyond. And, and beyond. The only one with an actuary report that says it does. Very good. And that's why it's gotten support from both the left, the right, and, and the center. I want to get into this subject that all three of us had, have had something to do with because in our states it's a very important issue. Transportation. In a lot of states of the union have a major problem of dealing with their own trust funds, their transportation trust funds, money that categorically set aside for whatever they choose to raise the money in that particular state to help in the roads, the airports, the bridges, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Why will we not invest in our transportation system, in our roads, and when we know that it's important not only for us, but for commerce in the United States of America. Michael, you're on the Transportation Committee. We looked at your leadership there. Gas tax is what primarily funds uh, transportation in this you're country. You're not even supposed to mention that. Well, that's what it is. It's 18.1 uh, <laughs> Yeah, and it hasn't changed day. since how in long? Almost 30 years. And everybody knows you cannot buy anything today anything, not milk, not steel for a road, for the same amount of money you could pay for it 20 or 30 years ago. Just can't be done. That's not unusual. Uh, but raising that amount of money has been impossible thus far in a, in a climate where all taxes are inherently evil. And what's ended up happening is that our infrastructure is slowly deteriorating. It's not just the roads and bridges. It's also our sewers and our sure. water pipes, the things you can't see that are below ground. 
and that it obviously impacts everybody's daily life. And, it's, and you know, mass transit is part of this, the roads are part of this, the, the airports are part of this. And the problem is, it, it really kind of strikes me as funny because the godfather of the modern Republican movement, Ronald Reagan, was the last president who doubled, not just increased, doubled right. the gas tax because he understood that an investment in infrastructure is an investment in ourselves. And it was Dwight Eisenhower that actually started the He started it the, and then the system. And then Ronald Reagan went from nine point eight cents to eight, yeah. nine point six cents to eighteen point two. And because of that he put hundreds of thousands of people to work building all these roads and right. fixing them. And stop and think about what this life would be like if we had the same road system of the, as the 1970s. We can't move as it is. Exactly. I, I, I mean, New Jersey has, has some real serious commuter problems. I mean, so does Boston, so does Connecticut. It's you know, actually we the largest, almost everywhere. The largest uh, public transportation system in the whole country. Yep. If you cut off federal money, <laughs> what, we, you can't drive. So what are you going to do? Fly in, uh, your own helicopter? Well, maybe we'll get to that someday. But people don't realize it. it's not just commuters. It's also interstate commerce. Right. I mean, the rail system from Washington to Boston is the most heavily traveled rail corridor in the country, one of the most heavily traveled in the world. That's right. And yet, guess how many tunnels go from New Jersey to New York for trains? <laughs> one. one. Yeah. And guess how old it is? Almost 100 years yeah, old. Yeah, it is. It's just, and yet we... And we screwed up building a new one when the present governor decided that we weren't going to, we're going to cut that off because there was going to be some over, over costs. That is horrible. And now we're going to build another tunnel, which is going to cost more than the original tunnel. It, Tell me what I'm missing it, here, John. It's <laughs> simply a matter of people not wanting to put investments into themselves. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, Mike's exactly right. And I think the whole question is investing in the American people. And look at whether it's by way of what I would call a user's fee, meaning you're going to be on the highway, you got to use gasoline, so when you fill up, tax it. Or I would favor a carbon. I would favor anything that creates the revenue for us to address the problem that every single certified board member who's taken a look at our infrastructure, and by that we mean roads, bridges, sewage systems, levees, but airports, deep harbors, uh, bus systems, broadband for our schools, all of the things that are essential for, as Mike points out, the flow of commerce, but also to take us into, you know, we're already in this century. We have to prepare for the next century. Right. you got to have the vision of people like Eisenhower and people certainly uh, like Ronald Reagan, which is amazing that the party in control doesn't look at this as an investment in the, in the American people. Instead, they look at this as a tax. And so consequently, thank God, uh, through the efforts of Mike and a good guy like Bill Schuster, we're able to get a somewhat of a nonpartisan program. Right. This was always a nonpartisan always, bill within the always. Congress. Only lately, because it's been scribed as a tax issue, do people refuse to invest in it. Meanwhile, the infrastructure is crumbling around us. Mm. I think, uh, I believe strongly that Hillary Clinton is going to be the next president. And, but whoever it is, I believe is going to, re, is going to invest robustly in our infrastructure because we have to. And the Republicans are finally coming around to the idea that if we're not able to look at congressional directed projects, as Mike likes to point out, and uh, to make those investments in our own districts, then what good are we representing our district if everything comes from the top down from the executive branch? And if we're not going to invest in our own people, then how are we going to move the country forward economically and from has, a job has standpoint? Your, has your state passed its trust fund that kept up? No, it, of course, all states are hurting because they... Uh, and, Yours? And Massachusetts increased the gas tax a little bit. Right. Um, not enough to keep up. Not, ahead, not enough to get ahead. Uh, enough to kind of keep Ask up. Ask me about New Jersey. I, I know the we answer. We haven't done anything. I know the answer. We haven't done anything. So how do I argue down here in the Congress of the United States, where there's only 12 congressmen here, Democrats, Republicans in New Jersey, we haven't even taken care of our own situation, and I'm asking the federal government to tax its citizens and send it money also, to New Jersey for transportation. By the state not putting enough money on the table, it also makes you relatively, de facto, ineligible to access billions of federal right. dollars. Right now, one of the projects that I've been working on for years is extending a subway line out to a very urbanized area. It's going to cost $2 billion. 
the federal government is coming up with one billion. If any state can't, if the state can't come up with its share, it's the sure. federal government won't give it. It's not the federal government doesn't pay for so anything. So then you don't 100%. build it. Well, you can't yeah. if the state doesn't have the money for its share of the cost. But, but how do you answer those people, Michael? Say, but now you're going to go deeper into debt in order to build this. Well, because like you know, that's the the, the, the the same argument we get all the time. Very simple. I went deep. You guys into are debt. going to break us, and you know, I we're went deep back. into debt for an education. I went deep into debt to buy a home. Mm -hmm. Why did I do that? Those were both in, both investments in my future and the future of my family. I didn't want to go into debt. I would have rather gotten a free education right. or somebody give me a home. But there are times in life when you go into debt in order to invest in your future. Transportation has always been one of those things. And bottom line is, again, if people are so short-sighted, they think the roads are somehow going to be built for free or the, tr or the, trans the, the daily commute from Patterson into New York and back is going to become so much easier by doing nothing, mm. they, they know they're kidding themselves. I mean, no one likes to pay. Everyone wants free stuff. Uh, nobody wants to pay for anything. But if that's the case, then you can't complain about having terrible infrastructure. But I, I see some glimmer of hope in the fact that we've got folks from the other side that want to talk to us about cutting, about taxes, increasing revenue, cutting taxes, certain taxes, et cetera, et cetera, and being fair about it and not, you know, moving towards simply those folks who make a lot of money, you know, protecting them. What about the average person in America? People are angry about this kind of stuff. I see that as hopeful. My, uh, and transportation the same way. That we even had a compromise, Mike, is is is, is, didn't is raise surprise to me. It, it was everything but the money. We yeah. kept the money flat. I, I want to be clear. Two or three years ago now, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, one of the most pro-Republican national organizations in the country, one of the most obviously the most business pro right. group in the country endorsed an increase in the gas tax. Right. Not because they, they think it's so easily done. They, yeah, so they represent the truckers. They represent all the people who will be paying. The trucks pay a lot of taxes when you increase the gas tax. They did it because they know that the investment's important. If the U.S. Chamber of Commerce can find a way to support new revenues, uh, certainly some of my political friends should be able to do I the still same. think it's a matter of courage as well. I mean, the very people in the Congress of the United States, Democrats or Republicans, who argue about any increased revenue, don't even want to talk about tax. They don't want to use the term in any any narrative whatsoever. So what does this mean? It means that, well, we're going to have to cut these programs in order to build this highway. Now, I'm oversimplifying, but no, I think the idea is... No, I think is that's, not you're not oversimplifying at all. And, and, and what that means is, well, the program maybe doesn't affect you, but it may affect all of these people over here. And, you know... We know programs have to be reviewed, reformed, et cetera, et cetera. But we, unless we get down to the nitty gritty and, and people don't understand revenue, expenses, and how you're going to pay for this kind of thing, but you don't pay for it on the backs of other people. But they, but they do if they simply put it in their own personal lives. Look, I want a beautiful indoor pool in my backyard. I can't afford it. So therefore, I don't have it. At the same time, I do have to paint the house every seven to ten years. Have to do it. I find the way to do it. And this country is a very wealthy country. And a very and we, innovative country. Very innovative country. And there are ways to get these things done, but it cannot be done for free. Right. And it cannot be done on the basis of income that's now 20 years without an increase. No one at home could put their lives together based on what they were earning 20 years ago. Michael, do you think that we would have better answers for the problems that face Americans if we had uh, authentic tax reform in the United States, like the Con Congress has been talking about it for 15 years, uh, nothing's happened. Do you think that that would be one of the very germane ways of getting this thing moving? It, it could be in a realistic way, but the last person to propose a comprehensive tax reform was the Republican chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. And, and the day he put it out, he got <laughs> croaked by his own party. Yeah. Nobody had a thoughtful discussion about what he did. They just crucified him on the basis of he was raising some things and lowering some things. Actually, it was a plan that I didn't like, but it had some good things in it, some bad things in it. More than happy to engage in a discussion, but he just got croaked and the thing went nowhere, and that's when they were in the majority. And, you know, they're still in the majority, and they haven't been able to bring a plan forward, even though there's not much space between what the president proposes 
and even what Dave Camp proposes. Absolutely not. But their lack of ability to compromise yeah. because they're dug in on these issues has presented, prevented us from doing the right thing, not only My for, way or the for highway. individuals, yeah. but also for corporate America. Yeah. You, know, you know, we should be lowering the tax rates on our, on our companies and providing extra incentives for manufacturing because of the right. four to one payback, but we also should be lessening the burden on individuals. But we have to look to lighten the load with earned income tax credits and other ways for us to recognize people who are at the lower end of the pay scale and then buttressing the ability of people in the middle class to hold on to what they've been able to make and make their dollar go right. further. And we can do that through the code. And there's, and there's not a great deal of difference, but what the reluctance has been is A, anything that Obama would be in favor of they couldn't be. They couldn't see it pass because it would be accredited ultimately to him. That's a shame. But that shows you what a small group of people dug in uh, can do. Uh, Grover Norquist most famously said, "Look, we want to take government and shrink it up so small we can drown it in the bathtub." <laughs> and unfortunately, there are a group that really subscribe to that theory until they take a step back and realize, "Well, wait a minute." That's my district, yeah. and who am I drowning Myself. in the bathtub? My constituents. After all, it's still we the people, and it's the people that are drowning because government isn't doing the responsible thing, including stepping up and making reasonable adjustments to the tax code so that we have the revenue to sustain ourselves, and then also looking at cuts in a way that will be beneficial, that provide incentive. All of us voted for the Research and Development Tax Credit, which is right. very helpful long term I, for I'm our business. I'm not afraid to talk about taxes. Over the 20,000 some odd pages in the tax code, most of those pages were put there by rich corporations that had enough money to hire rich lawyers to make them richer. <laughs> And I that's a, the fact of life. A, the proposal. average guy had nothing to do about that tax code. Very little. I made a proposal eight years ago to the then chairman of the what had what later became the Freedom Caucus. It wasn't even the Freedom Caucus then. That we get rid of every single exemption, every single deduction, every single credit in the corporate code, and simply make it a one item. To, and it would have by doing that. You, and keep the revenues the right, same, right. it would have reduced the rate by about 10%. We don't have, we're running out of time. I want to thank you, uh, Congressman Larson, Congressman Capuano. I really, really, really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. You've done a great service to the country. And now I would like to hear what you think about what we were talking about today. So you have any comments, if you have any, you have any concerns or questions, you got to stay tuned. Our address our phone number and the website address will appear in a moment. And thanks again. Thanks to our guests. They were terrific. I think you'd agree. And we'll see you on the next time on To The Point. Thank you, gentlemen.